get out and learn your land. That's really the most important thing. Think about you own this property. If it's your forever home, you're going to own it for a long time. And over those years, you're going to get to understand how your property responds to different things, different times of the year, wet seasons, dry seasons, spring, fall. I know I got a shady spot over here. You know, There's certain things you'll learn over time, but it starts just by getting out and measuring your lawn. Even if you've measured your lawn in the past, I recommend get out and do it again. Rewalk that lawn and just understand how much square footage am I dealing with? Because especially if you're a new homeowner, I talked to a lot of new folks just bought their first house. I mean, if you have a 5,000 square foot lawn, that's a lot different than an acre. I mean, you can't even really buy a lawnmower until you, with confidence until you measure your lawn first, right? To understand even how big of a mower you need, that type of stuff. So get out, walk that lawn, learn your land, and pay attention when you're doing it, right? What's up, guys? It's Keith Kelfis with the Untrapped Podcast. Right now, we have an awesome guest. We've got Alan Hain, the lawn care nut, tuning in live from Florida. And, bro, you're so awesome. We met a couple years ago, and you actually took my wife and I out to eat when we were visiting in Florida. Yeah. And you are like the lawn care expert, bro, the understanding. And actually, you have over half a million subscribers on YouTube talking about how to have a healthier lawn. And today, you're going to give us four tips and talk about some other cool stuff but primarily the people who watch my channel that are lawn and landscape you know either just getting started or been in the business you know one to five years and i really think it's cool that you can equip them with some knowledge that can make them be able to impress their customers when they're walking around and make more money and be a lot more knowledgeable and i'm just excited to have you on bro what's going on thanks i remember uh, when you guys came down for those of you that follow me on instagram i took them to the old river Roo over by there. We had a nice lunch time out on the water. The River Roo is where there's some people watching on Saturday nights sometimes and we get some fun dancing going on. So people that follow on Instagram will know that. But no, you know, I think it's cool, Keith. I appreciate you having me on. As you guys know, or as you know, I only talk to DIYers. Like that's my whole channel, right? Is giving tips to homeowners, DIYers. But over the years, I've noticed there are a lot of lawn professionals that are in the audience. And I've talked to many folks now over the years that talk about how they'll use my videos to teach some of their technicians or they'll to learn new things or they they're doing mow right now they're doing general maintenance but they want to get into the spray they want to learn how to kill weeds they want so they use my videos as a jumping off point to understand some of those basics so they can go on and get the further education and get licensed in their state i've heard stories like that so it's fun so i appreciate you having me on i love being in front of this audience of lawn professionals and if i can bring some value today also uh, stan genetic the dirt monkey I remember a few years back, I called him up. I was a little uh, frustrated. I was like, bro, I want to grow my YouTube channel. I wanna He's like, dude, you know who's crushing it right now? I'm like, who? He's like, you know whose videos you need to check out? Who? He's like the lawn care nut. And then I looked up your videos and are you filming with a GoPro? or Because the angle, the colors, everything is like, I don't know, it just sucks you right in, bro. So yeah, I know we're going to a GoPro on a selfie stick. <laughs> dude, <laughs> that was like so the thing, good. man. Yeah, we all walked around with our selfie stick and have the microphone with the big dead cat on the top with the yeah. cool little setup with your GoPro. <laughs> and for One those day. of you, there will be a replay here on YouTube where you can listen to the entire episode on the Untrapped podcast on Apple and on Spotify. And that'll be out in a few weeks as well. So let's get into it. All right. So you want to talk about some tips, huh? I wrote down four things. I'm going to pretend like we're talking to DIYers, but I think... Those of you that are lawn pros, this will help you understand the approach or the context that DIYers look at lawn care, which should help you communicate better with your customers. That would be the hope, right? So the first thing I tell people is get out and learn your land. That's really the most important thing. Think about you own this property. If it's your forever home, you're going to own it for a long time. And over those years, you're going to get to understand how your property responds to different things, different times of the year, wet seasons, dry seasons, spring, fall. I know I got a shady spot over here. You know, There's certain things you'll learn over time, but it starts just by getting out and measuring your lawn. Even if you've measured your lawn in the past, I recommend get out and do it again. Rewalk that lawn and just understand how much square footage am I dealing with? Because especially if you're a new homeowner, I talked to a lot of new folks just bought their first house. I mean, if you have a 5,000 square foot lawn, that's a lot different than an acre. I mean, you can't even really buy a lawnmower until you, with confidence until you measure your lawn first, right? To understand even how big of a mower you need, that type of stuff. So get out, walk that lawn, learn your land, and pay attention when you're doing it, right? Like as you're walking, do you feel bumps? Do you feel lumps, soft spots? Where are the shady areas? 
what are areas that are retaining water as you mow? Think about these things, right? And the way I talk about that is like your body. Like if you work out for people that do a lot of fitness, you know your body, you know how far you can push it. You know when you're going to get an injury, you slow down on certain things. You know, you just learn your body over time. And that's really the same with your lawn. You learn it over time. And that's really how you be successful. So that's the first thing I say is get out and learn your land. And it's yours, so focus on it and, and know it. Too philosophical? I don't know, man. Try to no, no, I like that. Fun. I was thinking about <laughs> like my lawn at my house, the front and the backyard. But I think of like claiming stuff as my territory, my space. And now that I'm thinking about it, there are some annoying areas in my own lawn where there's divots and there's weird bumps mm-hmm. and stuff. And I was like, dude, I'm a landscaper. I own a landscape business. And my lawn is very green. But at the same time, there's some parts of my lawn that piss me off. But I actually don't think far enough into let's fix it or let's find out what's going on. And then there's obviously all the spring weeds and dandelions and stuff like that. But all right. Yeah. yeah. There's simple things you can do too. Like a lot of people always want to reach for the chemical. Like that's how we're going to fix everything. Right. But sometimes, I mean, and maybe you need to install some drainage. Maybe you need to take care of your downspouts. Maybe there's thousands of gallons of water that come off the roof when it rains. Maybe that's why you got wet spots, you know? So doing things like putting in French drains or surface drains, those are not difficult tasks. Physically, they're difficult. But the science behind them isn't anything crazy. It's just slope and fall or whatever. So sometimes you can do things. Maybe you have to study over time or think about it over time. That's what I mean. As you watch things over time, you'll realize what's happening and can diagnose them and do some more fun work. I mean, that's the whole idea, right? We're trying to get more DIY projects out of this, you know? Mm-hmm. All right. You want to know a second one? Now, this one I really I think is important. This is, well, they're all important, but I talk about learn to love the mow. Enjoy the mow. Now, again, guys that do it for a living, I know y'all love mowing too. You do. There's a big change when there's something you love, but that thing is also what allows you to eat food and pay your rent. And you know those things, that love changes. <laughs> right so that love of mowing can kind of change when it's your living but for diyers for me it's my escape it's my de-stress time it's a time when no one can talk to me because it's loud and i have my headphones in so it's my me time put on a podcast right put on some music so that's enjoying the mow and when you do that you're actually making the lawn more healthy and i tell people don't just mow every saturday mow twice a week we call it a weeknight lawn work we call it you know, Wednesday nights, it's, it's getting darker later now, man. I look forward to getting off of work, going home and mowing the lawn on a Wednesday evening, a little sunset, have a couple two tree beers afterwards. You know what I'm saying? To me, those are experiences that I want to create and have fun with this time of year. Now, I realize a lot of y'all that are listening, it's probably 15 degrees wherever you are in Chicago or wherever people are calling listening. But down here, it's 85 degrees right now. So we're mowing. But I just say mowing is like cardio. So if we're going to put this on back onto a fitness type of thing, think of mowing as cardio. The more cardio you do, the healthier your heart is. Just makes you have more stamina. You're able to do things that you weren't able to do before when you have good cardio. So that's what mowing is. It's going to really strengthen the lawn. And that's actually true. The more you mow, the healthier your lawn will grow. So that's the second one. I like that. It's a good, we're going to do these too fast, man. We got to talk about some other stuff. You know? We will. That's a good reframe because even though I have a landscaping business, I hire a company to cut my grass because go figure. I don't have time to cut my own grass because it's like just more like it's like labor, right? Yeah. Late July, our lawn care company just MIA, they just disappeared, but it was already past all like the spring rains and all the in Michigan. And mm-hmm. then we had this drought where there wasn't really a lot of rain last year. So I just finished off the year cutting my own lawn myself and it was easy because I I could just do it once every few weeks because there was no freaking rain and I got a riding mower. I got all the stuff. I just did it real fast, but, um, I love it. I love putting on headphones and finishing up an audio book or, but now you're saying looking at as cardio, you could just look at it as a workout and personal development education time. Like, so it's reframing it. Yeah, from looking at it as work, but looking at it as getting paid to get a tan and work out yeah. and get totally. educated. Listen, you can burn in an hour of just basic mowing. I and mean, I'm talking with a self-propelled lawnmower because I'm not pushing a lawnmower, bro. You know, <laughs> so it's like 200 calories you burn in an hour. I mean, that's good work right there. And again, that's why I say mow two, three times a week. Get out there and do it. To me, it's better than fake work in a gym in some cases, you know, and you're right. You're outside. It's just beautiful. And it makes your lawn look better. So you get immediate result. You get immediate gratification, endorphin rush. There's so many things that you get out of having a healthy lawn. And it helps you want to do all the other things, right? Because, man, I'm mowing this thing. I want it to look good now. Like, Keith, it's got to be, like, frustrating to have to mow a dormant lawn in the summer in Michigan. I know you're doing it, but the stripes aren't the same. 
You know what I'm saying? You want that thing to be dark green where the stripes are pretty and it's lush. You know what I mean? It gives you the confidence to do other things in the lawn too to make it even more healthy. More of the Untrapped Podcast right after this. Jill's office provides friendly, professional receptionists for small business owners just like you. We can help answer your calls and we can even schedule estimates and jobs for you. Try Jill's office today and get a $25 discount when you say Untrapped. Just go to jillsoffice.com. This is Untrapped with Keith Kalfas. The, uh, As you people just, are vaping in the background. I can't see just, oh, maybe a little <laughs> I'm bit. I'm at a coffee shop. <laughs> you just gave me a flashback when I uh, had a lawn care job years ago. We did tons of residential and commercial, but there was a few different commercial properties we mowed that had like berms that were so steep that you couldn't get a rider on it. You couldn't get a walk behind on it. And you had to do it with the push mower. We called it the lawn boy thing. And whoever's lowest on the totem pole had to go push mow that thing. And it'd be a hundred degrees out. And you're like sideways off the side of like a freeway by a ditch with your feet in swamp and bugs all over you. Just, dude, it was hell, bro. And it's like, I'm talking mowing like whole areas, push mowing on an angle. I'll never forget that. I didn't look at that as a workout. That was not fun. But <laughs> See, so this is the difference, right? As a DIYer, I only have one lawn to love. I'm taking care of one property. I know it like the back of my hand. I can take care of the bug. This is the thing about being a DIYer, right? This is the advantage that I say. In fact, I tell people as a DIYer, your lawn should look better than every professionally cared for lawn. It just should because you're on that one property every day. You see it every day. <laughs> The lawn professionals there weekly, but he's not there every day. And if you have a spray company like a triggering or whatever, they're once every 30, 40, 50 days. So the DIYer though, it's every day. You could literally pick two weeds a day. That's 14 weeds a week, 60 weeds a month. I mean, how many weeds are you going to have in your lawn? I mean, it's not, <laughs> it's like do these tasks and make your lawn perfect. It's a lot of repetition. I say repetition is the key to learning. It's a lot of repetition and it's a lot of small jobs that you do. And I just did a video on leveling, lawn leveling, right? And you should see the fun discussions people have on lawn leveling. <laughs> have you seen any of these, Keith, about people doing the big, where they put the sand all over their lawn and they level it all out? Have you seen these videos? I've watched down entire the lawn leveling videos with, with yeah, sand. Yeah, and... right? we all have. So <laughs> the discussions that people get into about, well, if you use this kind of sand and you don't use this kind of sand, it's going to turn your lawn to concrete. Have you heard that myth? They say that if you put sand on a lawn that is clay, it will turn the lawn to concrete. <laughs> I've never heard of that. Is this false? <laughs> oh, my God. It's a, yeah, it's super false because to make concrete, you need Portland cement. But yeah. And so there's discussions that go around about this is my life, bro. These are the kind of videos I get to make. So <laughs> I'm making videos on lawn leveling. You don't have to make it such a big deal. This is what I'm going back to. It's these like small work, small things you do. We talked about, you know, if you got to put in drainage or if you got to correct these little things here and there. And leveling is one of those. If you have bumpy spots or whatever, and it's not because of a water issue or a way the water's flowing on your property issue, that's when you're doing leveling. Well, you don't have to destroy the whole lawn and level it in one day like you're on a golf course. Just get a couple bags of sand and throw it a sand over by there in the low spots. Let it level itself out as it gets wet. Maybe you throw down a bag this week, a bag next week. What I'm saying is it's like, these little things that you do are what are going to make the biggest difference. And it's really one of my points here is I had is have patience. Like we're talking about a living thing here. This goes back to the bodybuilding or health, right? You don't go to the gym one time and all of a sudden you look great. It takes a lot of work to get yourself healthy. And the same was with a lawn too. Now, some people have it easier than others. Like if you start taking care of your lawn in the spring when it's raining and it's 75 degrees every day, you're going to see faster results. Then if you start in the middle of the summer in Michigan, when it's dormant, it's 100 degrees, right? If you have a St. Augustine lawn in Florida, it's going to always be hard for you because we're 24-7 year round where lawns don't go to sleep. So the jungle is always trying to retake the land here. So that's a difficult task, but the approach is the same. Hey, real quick, what do you do if you have like a pest problem like mosquitoes and then, but you have a dog and you want to make sure that the chemicals aren't going to make your animals sick? Yeah, so that's where I always tell people to read the label, number one, and follow what the label says, because there's going to have some of the questions that you might have about your pets will be on the label, for example, re-entry periods. They'll say on there, keep pets and, and kids off for an hour or until the dog is dry or water it in. So what you want to do first is read the label and follow all the instructions that are on that label. Those instructions are there to keep you safe, right? Yeah. 
And then over and above that, it's really, it's a personal choice. What's the risk you're willing to take? You know what I'm saying? I mean, it, you know, Dude, I, I, like, I don't like chemicals. Stuff. I don't like Roundup. I don't spray it in my landscape business because I have beliefs about it. And then think about like you're spraying a chemical and then the wind blows and now it gets all over your face and your skin or in your eyes and on your hands or like, and I think about it's, it absorbs directly so into your bloodstream. That's another thing. But that's another thing that's on the label. See, there'd be a wind restriction on the label that would tell you don't spray if it's over 10 miles per hour. So if you don't follow that label and it gets on you, you see, that's why you want to know these things. Overall, though, I mean, it's up to you. I mean, I worked for True Green Chemical for 15 years. So I'm not scared of the spray. I'm not scared of the chems like that. I believe in following the label. I believe in integrated pest management, which means I don't reach for the chemical first. Kind of mentioned that earlier, right? I've mentioned already on this podcast several ways to do things to make your lawn better that involve no chemicals, like picking two weeds a day is 60 a month, right? But there are times when you're going to need to use chemicals. So when you have a weed problem, for example, weed infestation, that is affecting your primary crop. In my case, my primary crop is turf grass. When those weeds are affecting the performance of that turf grass and its job, then I'm going to have to use a chemical but I'm going to use it smartly. So for example, I'm not going to use a weed and feed product, right? That I could get at a store because weed and feed means the feed part's good. Fertilizer. I want that across the entire lawn. In fact, I want that evenly coated across the lawn, but the weed control that's also in there. That's also a granular. I don't want to throw that in an area that doesn't have weeds. I don't have weeds in a hundred percent. And they're only maybe over here or over there where they're scattered in zones or spots. Well, if I'm using a weed and feed, I'm actually now throwing weed control everywhere, even where it's not needed. That's not environmentally friendly. So I go integrated pest management, which says I'll do my fertilizer and granular, but then I'll whip out a liquid and I'll spot spray my weeds. So now I have less pounds on the ground of chemical overall. So I'm just safer by design because I put less chemical down and I only put it where it was needed to target it. You follow? Bro, so you're speaking the, the, the just kinda... gold to me right now. You're defining yeah. the space, you're chopping it up and you're creating just making points of stuff because if you don't know about something and you're not knowledgeable or you don't have the education you just kind of lump it all into a category and you think if you repeat that over and over in your mind that's just truth but it's actually could be false just well keep there, going. everything is in the gray everything's in the gray so it's not a issues like this are not black and white it's in the gray right that's where you educate yourself and you understand what you're willing to tolerate what your thoughts are what your beliefs are but i like to get more educated so Back to the weed problem, you know, so we talk about spot spring, but this is where mowing comes in. Mowing creates a healthier lawn. I mean, weeds aren't happy when they're mowed over. Weeds not happy when it gets cut. So that's good. Some weeds can be mowed out with frequent mowing. Again, more environmentally friendly. The other thing is we want to fertilize the lawn to make it thicker because a thicker lawn is the best defense against weeds, right? It's just all competition, especially warm season turf, Bermuda grass, zoysia. These are grasses that can literally choke weeds, literally choke weeds. They have Sylvester stolons that just reach out and just crush. And so we want to use that to our advantage. We're going to fertilize that lawn. I'm going to feed that beast. I'm going to hammer my lawn with fertilizer so that it thickens up and helps me. Now it's less chemicals. And then Overall, though, once you start taking care of weeds and you get on top of a weed problem, you can pretty much eliminate it, especially in cooler season lawns. What are you doing with some clover, some dandelion, typically? So it, once you knock crops out for a couple of years, there's no seed being left behind. You're not going to get a reproduction anymore. And so you could literally go to zero. In fact, this is the thing about chem lawn, true green. Whatever your thoughts are about true green chem lawn, we were good at controlling the basic weeds that people had. And I mean, I was a general manager and I watched chemical cost. And that's one of the ways that I, that's one of the things I was good at was keeping my chemical costs low, which at that time we wanted chemical cost to be 12% or less of uh, gross revenue. So if you think about that, one of the ways you do that is you keep your customers long-term so they don't have weeds anymore. Then you don't have to spray as much weed chemicals. So you have less chemical costs. But what that taught me was that you could actually eliminate a weed problem for a customer. We saw it. That's what Kim Long was good at. So we had customers in Chicago, it's probably still like this on the South side over by there where I used to work that had been with us 25 years. They had been with us since the seventies. Now I worked at True Green in the late nineties, two thousands, but customers that had been with us since the seventies, you could see their history. And these people, they had zero weeds. They just didn't. I mean, it was like just a little bit of fur. <laughs> so anyway, I'm just saying you can eliminate a weed problem and then no more chemicals. So what if you have a lawn care company that comes and on their route, their property that they cut directly before your house each week that day was like an old nasty factory it was filled with like mm -hmm. weeds and dandelions and then it's all stuck under the mower and everything and they bring cross pollinate it sure can but this is where the thick lawn comes in right because that thick dense mat of turf is going to help to keep those seeds whatever they are from rooting in it's more of a problem with warm season turf 
you hear me keep making this distinction because it's so important because you need to know your turf type really because they both eat differently but like a little stitch of bermuda grass that gets taken into a saint augustine grass lawn that bermuda will be well established within just a few months but those are things that are being propagated vegetatively not from seeds from weed seeds so a little different thing there but this is another advantage to being a DIYer, see, because my mower only hits one man. It's like a you said so propagated vegetatively. Yeah, I'm just trying to sound smart, bro. No, I love <laughs> it. What's the third tip? So, the third tip is don't be afraid. And we'll get to, to your throw. comments. I see the comments rolling in, so we'll get to them in a few minutes. I see them all here. What's the third tip? Don't be afraid to throw down. So this goes. So I'm gonna go back to my exercise and bodybuilding thing. I want you to think of nitrogen or just fertilizer in general, but nitrogen. I want you to think of that as your pre-workout. I want you to think of that as is what charges you, man. So nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, nitrogen drives the bus. Put nitrogen fertilizer down on your lawn and it will turn the lawn green. It will stimulate growth. It will push roots, but really it's just going to make the lawn green so you dominate everyone. The thing about fertilizing is people have a fear of it. Even lawn professionals that are like mow companies, I talk to a lot of guys like that. They have a fear of fertilizer. They're afraid they're going to burn something. So fertilizer doesn't burn the lawn unless you spill it. just going to tell you that right now. Even if you put down a triple thick application for some reason, because you didn't read the label, because you didn't calibrate your spreader, whatever, you're not going to burn the lawn. So I don't want you to be afraid to fertilize. As a DIYer, you know, I only have one lawn to take care of, right? So it doesn't take me long to become a professional on my one lawn that's five or 8,000 square feet, because I'm going to push the spreader the same direction every time. I'm going to know that I got to, if I'm doing liquid, I got to hook the hose around this tree in order to get to this back corner, right? These are also things that lawn professionals learn that have routes that handle five, 600 customers. They know I always enter from this side so I can get this over here. And, I, and it, when we were at Kim Long, it was about where are you going to hook the hose? What are your pull points? You know, things like this. A DIY are a bigger advantage. I have one small lawn to learn. Professionals more. But I think you learn on your own. As talk, I'm talking to lawn professionals. A lot of y'all, you want to add spray service. And I think you should. I think it's an excellent way to make good profit and offer something to customers that that's a little less competition and a little less saturation. Mm. And I think something that, that customers are also willing to look at as, how do I say, like, it's easier to make distinctions if you're a spray company than it is as a maintenance, just mowing and trimming. It's easier to make distinctions as a spray company. You have more things like, are you organic? Are you natural? Whatever, you know, there's just ways to come across as different. What's the clear route if a lawn care landscaper professional wants to get into spraying? Like where would they go seek out that knowledge? And Yeah, I would go to one of my trainings called yardcarebootcamp.com. <laughs> yardcarebootcamp.com? Dot com, yeah. Perfect. That's my training. And I made that actually for DIYers. But I go into everything from pounds on the ground, what is fertilizer, how much do you put per thousand square feet? We do liquids, we do granulars, how to spray weeds, different tips, sprayers. So it's really good. And it's a great way. It's like a gateway drug for you guys that want to actually do this for a living. This is like a gateway drug for you, that training. So I would recommend you that. But what you want to do is you want to call your local county extension because every single state has different laws on what you need to be licensed in order to apply pesticides to lawns. Most states you can apply fertilizer, but pesticides are what you need. And if you don't know what pesticides are, I like to go over this, the IDES. So think of IDES or something. IDES kill, like homicide, right? kill right so pesticide ide is a killer and then pest is a pest so pest killer is what a pesticide is now underneath there you have different pet you have different pesticides you have herbicides that kill plants you have fungicides that interrupt or kill fungus right you have insecticides that kill insects are so those considered order, pests oh sure all of these are pests and all of these are pesticides okay okay keep going all right yeah. So in order to spray pesticides and get money, you have to be licensed in every Go, state. Keep um, going into the different sides, though, because before I interrupt you, I just wanted the clarity. So you got pesticides, oh, you got herbicide, I mean. you got fungicide, which kills funguses. What are the other ones? Yep. I can't think of any others off the top of my head, but even the, the mitis, you could have, you have like a miticide. So you even have like insecticides that go down if they're more targeted. The point being is you need to be licensed in order to apply those. And you're going to need to apply those in order to get results for your customers. Nobody wants you to just put down fertilizer. They want those things gone. So with that, you have to be licensed and every state's different. Like Florida, you have to actually work underneath someone else who has a license for so many years as like an apprenticeship where you mm. can even be eligible. Whereas like when I was in Indiana, you just had to take a test and you go, we went to Purdue University, we would get the book, we'd go through the course and then you just test out. 
So every state's a little bit different than there's reciprocal licenses. So you want to call your local county extension service. That's their job. If you don't know what your extension is, they're an extension of your land grant university. And this is what they do. They work with lawn professionals and they sometimes are the ones that do inspections and things like that. So you call them and go, Hey, I want to spray. What do I do? Where's my start? And they will help you. That's one of the things they do. Some of them will start mentoring you or give you contacts. So I would recommend you do that first or secondly, and then that way you can start learning. What does it take? And then really just work with other professionals. You will find that the people in this business are willing to help you out. They're willing to work with you and mentor you. They really are. And I would find somebody like that locally that's a good mentor and maybe go work for them. I'll give you one other piece of advice for anybody that's really young that's listening and you're looking to start out. I recommend you go work for True Green. I really do. I think you should go work for them for a couple of years and you might end up staying for uh, 20 and making a career and being a general manager of a 12 or $15 million facility, making 150 grand a year, being in charge of 70 people. That's a really respectful position in life. Or you might do it for two years and realize, holy cow, this corporate lawn care isn't for me and I'm out. But what you'll learn is you'll learn how to sling a hose. You'll learn how to fill trucks. You'll learn how to make proper applications because they watch chemical costs. So you'll know exactly how to make a proper application, learn how to push a bucket. So many good things you will learn. It's worth it. It's like free training for you. And then you get out and do it better or different. Or like I said, where you end up staying. You're connecting mad dots for me, bro. (laughs) I know a guy who shut down his lawn care business. He just got real frustrated after a long time. And, um, you know, I think what the nail on the head was for him, he was out spraying herbicide without a license and he got dinged with some pretty fat fines. And on top of that, a couple of bad years, he was just threw in the towel after years. And then he said, I'm going to go work for True Green. And he went and worked for True Green. And now he's actually really happy and he's making good money. I don't know. It's great. It's interesting. So when I worked for True Green and like I said, outside of Chicago, Northwest Indiana area, we had, again, lawn specialists that had been with us for 25 years. I mean, I worked in Maryville, Indiana branch. We probably had seven or eight guys with over 20 years. And you know what? They live a good life because you got to realize in those areas, you get laid off in the winter, but you plan for it. And so you're working nine months a year and you're making, I mean, this is back when I was there, you make 55, 60 grand. Again, I think it's probably a lot more than that now, but to work nine months a year and make 60 grand and live a nice life. And some dudes would go like to Mexico during the week year or whatever, or during the winter, whatever they would do. I mean, it was a good life. It's a a respectable job. And again, most people listening to this, you're going to want to move into management. You could be a management and operations. You're training technicians. One of my favorite things to do is train technicians. If you ask me, what is my YouTube channel? What it started as is me doing the training that I used to do to my lawn care techs and really sales reps. I was mostly in sales and marketing. Couldn't tell. But I would train these guys, and that is what's been adapted now into my programs here. The same training, how to spray weeds. What does it mean? Why do we use this tip versus that tip? How many pounds per thousand? How much nitrogen do we put per application? What results should we expect from that? I would teach my people at True Green, not just do it on the internet. I've been doing it for 12 years now on the internet. But I mean, when you guys, if I talk about True Green, y'all, I haven't worked there in, I guess, that many years. (laughs) A lot of years. So anyway. I love it. There, but yeah. What's your uh, next tip, man? What's the fourth tip? The fourth one is, and kind of touched on this a little bit, is don't expect immediate results. So many people, they want to put a miracle application on the lawn that's going to take care of everything and this one thing. And I get it. It's how our world operates now. We want immediate results. And lawn care is different. And this is why it's good therapy for people. This is why it's good training for people. I found a lot of IT people, a lot of people in engineering type jobs really love lawn care because of how different it is. When you're an engineer or when you work in IT, everything is numbers and math, zeros and ones, right? And so everything has an if, then, this, that way to work it out. But lawns aren't like that. It's nature, man. And it throws curveballs at you and it will always win. The weather always wins. And so people see that as such an interesting challenge, such a new way to train your mind, to work and to think and to problem solve in real time. And it's something that you live with. It's in your front lawn. It's yours. You own it. You're going to be with it for a long time. So think of this as one of those challenges that you're going to go after for a long time. And even after you've been doing it for years, it's going to kick you in the butt sometimes. So it's not an immediate thing. It's something you go with. You got to start with the basics, which is number one, which is learn your land, walk your lawn, learn what it's like, be observant. Number two is go back and learn your mowing, right? Just mow the lawn, mow, mow, mow. Number three was throw down, see what happens, man. Push a little more nitrogen and see what your lawn does. Throw down a little iron. Well, I like the way that works. You know what I mean? Do some things. Have a little fun with it. If what you throw some do? iron down on the lawn, how long until you can see it doing what? Like They're all a little different. So we have a foliar 
absorb iron that we sell. It has just a scotch of a little bit of scotch. What a stupid word. It has just a little bit of nitrogen in it, and it's a foliar absorbed liquid. And so you spray that on, and you can see results within a few hours sometimes because it absorbs right through the tissue of the plant. What so there's you, that, and then you have iron in for like mine. It turns the lawn blue-green. So if you want your lawn to be a darker bluish green color, you want something with iron in it or ammonium sulfate, which is a nitrogen source also will do that. That's what I mean. So you experiment with different things. Like I saw a whole line of fertilizers called Yard Mastery. I want everybody to use my fertilizers, but there's all kind of other stuff you can play around with. I play around with other stuff too. <laughs> I'm actually making a video. I killed a palm tree because I get so many samples of- where all your fertilizers <laughs> are? I'm going to look it up. So yardmastery.com. That's, That's my right. line of fertilizer. I have like a five program. And then I have an app. If y'all want that, a lot of lawn pros use that too. We've actually had you requesting music customer, but we don't do it that way. But you download it and what the app is called Yard Mastery. What the app will do is give you a lawn program based on soil temperatures in your area. And so you put in your address and then we give you your soil temperature, which tells you like time to throw down per dime and pre-emergent, right? To stop crabgrass soil. Those are like soil temps around 50. Also when to put down fertilizer, what fertilizer to put down. So it's like a lawn program for you. And then if you do our soil test, now you get a custom program based on your exact soil test results in the app. Dude, your website you loaded instantaneously. Yeah. Bam. It loaded immediately. It's Shop I can't take credit. It's Shopify. <laughs> wow. It's on Shopify. So I if y'all don't, I mean, I, think, I guess a lot of folks don't know. I mean, I have an e-commerce business now. I started in YouTube and all that, but over the years, we built an e-commerce business called Yard Mastery. So we have our own fertilizer line. We have a warehouse here in Lakewood Ranch. We have another area in South Carolina we rent out. And we ship fertilizer all over the country. People use our app to uh, get a lawn program in there. And, but it starts with this stuff, what we're talking about, right? I'm trying to give people tools, right? And I'm trying to build a business on something I love. But I want people to be inspired for their own land, for their own lawn, for, for what they do. Because it's, it's what I love. And I know other people have that same love. Sometimes you do it because you want to dominate your neighbors, right? <laughs> Sometimes you do it because you want everybody to go, dang, this dude's got his lawn dialed, right? When you're me and you're five foot eight and you're shaped like a bowling pin, you're not dominating anyone on a sports field, but my lawn looks better than yours, bro. You know, that's kind of how, <laughs> you know what I mean? So you got to think that's the way I kind of look at it. And I know there's a lot of people like that, like that too. Alan Hain, the lawn care nut on YouTube, bro. <laughs> Let's get there to some go. comments. Austin yeah. Douglas, Ditch the Itch, has a poison ivy remediation company. And he was on the podcast a few weeks ago. He says, Alan is a master marketer. I love it, which you are a master marketer. You're a brilliant marker. Let's go here. Lost the plot. I see you all the time on here, bro. There's more to horticulture than just mowing. Of course. Yeah, for sure. Andrew Tate. What's he saying? <laughs> Andrew, Andrew Tate. <laughs> Loving the live chat streaks. Now you got lawn nut on here, buddy. I want to see where and how I can send some cigars to the lawn care nut. Thank you, Austin. I got out of my cigar habit recently. I'm going to pick it back up, though. So uh, You're going to pick it back some, up? Yeah, going streaks with cigars. I get to a nice. point where I will smoke two or three a week. And usually it's this time of year, actually. If you want to send me cigars, you can send them to 3125 Lakewood Ranch Boulevard, number 110. Hey, wait, let me write that Florida, down. All right, just text it to me yeah, later. Say it again. I will. I'll text you later. Bradenton, Florida, 34211. That's our warehouse. Thank you, right. Austin. I appreciate it, man. I'll send you some stickers back. So back to the whole thing with, with cigars. It's usually this time of year when the sunsets are later, right? Because I'm a guy that goes to bed like right after sunset. So when sunsets at like 5.15 in the winter, it doesn't work out. But now it sunsets like whatever, 8.30 or something. So yeah, I go to the beach and have a cigar a couple, two, three times a week. So I go in those streaks and then I usually end up buying too many and my humidor gets full. So then I stop buying for a while. I've been taking my humidor down is what I'm saying. And then not, now I've been on an off time. So it's time to get back going. Long story, but yeah, I do appreciate a good cigar. Just going through these comments here. Michael Crowers and Andrew Tate lost the plot. We got Creams Consult. Why is my so dog why? always digging out my lawn and flowers? I mean, that, I think that's a training issue right there. I don't know what the breed is. I'm not a dog expert. So I'll just tell you the two natural enemies to lawns are dogs and trees. So just think about that. If you love lawns, that's why I don't have a dog. And that's why I only have palm trees because palm trees don't compete with the lawn. Remember that. <laughs> Steve DeHunt, spray it. That's right. Spray it and pray it. Spray it and pray it. Professional route had more barriers to entry for licensing. That's exactly right. That's why it's a less competition. I'm sure that's what he's talking about, right? There's a bigger barrier to entry in spraying, so you have less people doing it. 
two years experience with the Pestida applicator firm before you can make your own business. Exactly. Yep. So this is another reason why to go to True Green. Let them give you the free training. You're going to learn good and bad things, but you're going to learn a lot of good things. It looks like a good one. I'm going to read that one. Oh. Yeah, yeah, this one. Michael, I, I prefer slow release fertilizer. I can buy a $25 bag and I charge them $25 to apply it. I can get two lawns per bag, so it is a pretty good little side hustle. Totally agree, Michael. That's where I would recommend start learning and understanding the amount of nitrogen that you're applying because that's really what's going to deliver the visual result for the customer. Now, there's other things that should be applied like phosphorus and potassium or in a lot of cases, no phosphorus because your area has high phosphorus already. It might be a good idea to conduct a soil test in one or two neighborhoods that you're applying for. But going back to the simple basics of it is understanding nitrogen it takes about three quarter pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet to get a visual response out of the lawn. And so if you can get a synthetic fertilizer, that's a higher amount of nitrogen that you can put less pounds on the ground. You might get three or four or five lawns out of a bag. For example, a 45 pound bag of my fertilizer will cover 15,000 square feet. And the average lawn in my area was 5,000. So I could get three lawns out of that. Whereas a bag of malorganite, is 38 pounds only covers 2,500 square feet because it has an application rate that's much higher, like 15 or 16,000 pounds per thousand. So I know I'm talking a lot mm. of math here, but this is why I want you to learn those things because what you can end up doing is this is how you optimize your business is by understanding what pounds on the ground you're applying, what's going to give the visual response and chemical cost down. Anyway, that's not what you asked for, but uh. he's like, he's like, I got a side hustle, bro. I'm doubling my, I'm already doubling, which is good. It's a good way to start. I love it. Found your Google listing, Keith, 4.9 stars. I did have five stars, but 2018, I was really, really, really busy. And this customer called for a quote and he sounded like a kid with a bad attitude. And for some reason I had a chip on my shoulder that week. And then I was really busy and I was like, I would, dude, I had way too much on my plate. And I canceled the quote because it just sounded like, I thought it was some type of like not worth my time. Instead of giving each and every single individual customer the honor of being a completely polite, I just made a snap judgment and I canceled the quote on the customer. And then dude, this dude ripped me a new one on Google just for canceling the quote. And I called him back, apologized. And I was like, dude, please, please. I'm sorry. It was my fault. He, he, he removed the review, but the one star rating remained. And then I learned mm-hmm. you have to treat every single customer, no matter what you're in the service business. So anyways that's such a challenge isn't it like if you think about this goes back to because I, I often i think about these things being a diy versus a lawn pro and, and when i work for true green and when you're the operator and the owner at the same time that's a lot more stress because you can't afford to have those moments like you just mentioned right but when you're the owner and you have several employees you have a couple managers that work for you they help to kind of shield some of that for you so you don't have to get into those weeds right that's why i go back to working for a company like True Green, you learn things that well, you're going to get really railed on by customers, but you'll learn some of that, right? Like how it is to have a little separation from you'll start as customer facing and then you're working, managing people and then you're managing managers. Those are all such good things for, I think, for young people to learn because I'm not a college guy. I didn't, you know, I went to junior college for two years, which was like basically high school again. And then I went to an unaccredited college for three years and never finished. So I never really went to college. So and I think a lot of people nowadays don't need to. And, and I, I say, go get that real training at somewhere that is doing what you want to do, whether you like the way they do it or not. If they're the biggest, if they're the leader, go learn from them. You know, I just tons think that's of really organized important. training. Yeah, and then exactly. Right. You go apply it or in your own business. Or some disorganized training. Or some disorganized training. <laughs> but you see, but one thing is their checks are going to cash every Friday. You're going to get medical benefits if you need them. So there's a lot of positives there too that you can do while you're learning. And one other tip about the negative review I got. We got like 200 Mm -hmm. positive five-star reviews, but if you ever get into a place in your business where you are just burned out and you're sick of talking to customers and you cannot muster up the energy to be super nice and polite and happy and helpful just because it happens, hire a receptionist who will be the good facing voice for your business. And then you could just lead the field and muscle through it, which I did. I just hire more people to help you. Thanks. Green up lawn care. Ray D. Love Alan. He is so informative. I get riffing. It's fun. I don't get to riff like this a lot, you know? I like it. Scott Jennings, Greenleaf Coast in the house. Whoa, trees are not the enemy, sir. They have their own preferences to environment. They do. It's one of the biggest questions I get. How do you grow grass under a tree? Like, a lot of times you don't. (laughs) 
I don't know if you could answer this question. Tyler Jelks says, any tales from the trenches from your true green years as far as crazy customers? Yeah, I got well, I got a few stories. I told one. I don't know if I've ever told this one. So one Is of this, this anything that could cause a problem? No, no. Statue oh, of limitations. It was a long time ago. Okay. <laughs> I'm joking around. No, this is just a funny one that'll give a tip at the same time. So one of the things that I learned, and I'll actually shout this out, a a manager of mine at True Green, his name is Chris Garcia. Shout out to Chris. He's still around. Taught me this. When you go to customer properties, they have brown spots, especially in a lawn that's overall green everywhere, but they have a few brown spots and it's newer construction. The first thing you always do is you take a metal probe and jam it into the middle of the brown spot. And what you find under there, literally nine times out of 10 is a rock, a brick, a piece of just construction debris that was left. And again, this is mainly in, back then they were new construction, but within any house built in the last 20 years, they're going to be around edges, they're going to be around sidewalks, always do that. We had this one customer in Valparaiso, Indiana, that I went to his house, and this is what I discovered. He called for brown spots. The lawn is a beautiful lawn, dark green. It just looks gorgeous. Kentucky bluegrass. But there was like maybe 15 or 20 brown spots about the size of a brick well because that's what was there but around the front yard and so i did the same thing i'd shove a probe in there and you can hear it ding 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 so i dug one out put it on the porch left the note hey man this is what it is you got these bricks under there blah blah the dude literally called me back and called me a liar you're lying this is not the brown spots your technician burnt the lawn he was so adamant that my technician burnt the lawn (laughs) even though i dug up a freaking brick and put it on his front porch (laughs) and told them so the tip there is though the first time you see a brown spot in your lawn the first rule of thumb is to dig just dig just see what you find it's already a brown spot what are you gonna do you can make it worse so dig under there dig there might be something underneath there stopping what deep root penetration well it might be that yes exactly right or drying it out faster some people just have rocks that under the lawn from the aggregate from the driveway or whatever so the rocks kind of peter out in a can't think of the term here, but you know what I'm saying? So yeah. the rocks are closer to the surface, right? Close. So those areas will dry out faster a lot of times. We had a this commercial client, your land. landscaping, yeah. a garden bed commercial client, and we plant a row of yew shrubs and a bunch of other stuff and mulch it all. And the yew shrubs died. We replaced them on warranty. They died again. And what the hell's going on? And I start digging deeper than the planting depth and about, I don't know, 12 inches underneath the ground. It was a slab of concrete underneath in the garden bed and it was actually holding water and drowning the slug just the way it was set up mm, i was like the opposite of what man. you think yeah crazy yeah there's so many things like that that you just you don't know mm, the next one oh austin uh, you're oh, talking I, uh, some fun stuff now i have to read it for the people on the podcast who aren't, oh, aren't watching God. austin douglas says high phosphorus applications equals runoff equals algae blooms equals no bueno what does that mean that's a fun one well so I'll, I'll relate it here to Florida. So we have restrictions in the summertime where we cannot apply nitrogen or phosphorus fertilizers. Now, in most of Florida, we don't need phosphorus anywhere. Our soils are already super high in it. But there is occasion to apply it when, you're, when you do find a deficiency or if you're doing sod, for example. But anyway, we have these blackouts in the summer. The reason we have these blackouts, no nitrogen, no phosphorus in most counties, is because in Florida, we have massive thunderstorms that hit us every afternoon for about 25 to 30 minutes. Everybody that's ever been here in the summer knows, especially if you come to where I live, right? I live in Bradenton, St. Pete, Tampa Bay area. It rains here every day in the summer for like 30 minutes at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It's awesome. Stick around as Keith returns with more of the Untrapped podcast in just a moment. Hey, if you're looking for what is probably the greatest software ever to run your business on, go to getjobber.com forward slash Keith. You can create proposals, invoices, collect payments, even track your entire business directly on the Jobber smartphone app. And if you want to get a totally free trial of Jobber right now, open your browser, type in getjobber.com forward slash Keith. And if after the trial, you decide you want to sign up with Keith's link, you'll automatically get 20% off your first six months. So what are you waiting for? Go to getjobber.com forward slash key. This is Untrapped with Keith Kalfas. It's just what we do. Cools everything off. I could talk to you about how the building clouds help your lawn, all kinds of fun things. Free nitrogen from the lightning. If you guys don't know, every time lightning strikes, it releases natural nitrogen in the air that is carried down into your lawn. Lawn will green up after the lightning storm. 
So look it up. Not no BS. So no, I had a funny. I, I imagined you like with a kite like lightning and you outside measuring my free nitrogen give me my free nitrogen yeah give me the free nitrogen on like a youtube thumbnail you're like that's a good idea i'm gonna do that i need somebody to design a t-shirt so i'm getting to a story here that's going into what austin's talking about so because of those storms if you were to have applied fertilizer typically granular before that anytime those thunderstorms are so fast and so violent that they will wash that fertilizer out and they will wash into the street. This is the theory. I've never tested it, but it sounds logical, right? And there's laws because of this. So everything in Florida leads to a river, which actually ultimately leads to either the Gulf of Mexico or to the Atlantic Ocean. Everything in Florida, we're a land of rivers. It's in a Jimmy Buffett song. So if that fertilizer was to be blown off of your lawn from a thunderstorm in the summer and go down into the rivers and then out into the Gulf, or mainly the Gulf, or the Atlantic, it can create what is called red tide. Uh, not create, I'm sorry it can exacerbate red tide. Red tide is a, and I'm not an expert here, so if I'm speaking out of turn, go Google it. But red tide is something that happens in the water that it kills fish. It's some sort of, I don't know if it's a bacteria or what it is, but it's a natural occurring thing, but phosphorus in the waters can make it worse. I think nitrogen also can fuel it. And so they have these bands here to stop us from fertilizing so we don't exacerbate the red tide because red tides kill fish, it smells bad. You can't go in the water when there's red tide here. Fish are all washed up all over the beach. It makes you cough. It's bad. It's, it's like bad. So, and it kills our tourism. So there's those laws. So this is what Austin, ultimately I'm getting back to, what Austin's getting back to is phosphorus runoff can create those algal blooms, which here is red tide. So Austin, correct me if I said anything wrong there. I think I'm in the neighborhood of correct <laughs> bro science. Wow, that's powerful. So, so there's, there's yeah. so you have a sacred trust also with, nature and earth to be a good steward of the environment as well. That's correct. And you'll find that I do education every summer on this exact thing in my email list. By the way, if you go to the lawncarenut.com, you can sign up for my free email list. That's where my best content is, is in my weekly emails. And where I go into it? subjects like this, the lawncarenut.com. The lawncarenut.com. Yeah, sign up for my email list. This is where I go into topics like this, where I actually I go through and research give you links, teach you about it. I do a lot of education every summer on the blackouts and I follow them and I teach people what products you can apply. That's why we apply iron, for example, in the summer because we can keep our lawns green without the nitrogen by sea kelp. Anyway, lots of things. So this is all part of the education that I do as well. Good topic, Austin. Bro, you're just full of good knowledge, man. All it's right. fun. Like I said, I'm not going to do this much. Everything I do is like, looks like YouTube. So it's fun to just talk. Carmen Knoll says, what a great mix of lawn men here. What up, Carmen? Drew's Lawn Care. Hey. Yo, Lawn Care. Hey, Drew. Jason Palamantiero. Dog pee or poop cause brown spots too. All right, let's talk on here. Uh, yeah. so, let's talk about it. So your dog's pee is urine, and urine sounds like what nitrogen source? Do you know? Urea. So urea, nitrogen, is it's in some of my fertilizers. It's a nitrogen source that will turn the lawn green. The issue or the challenge you have when it comes out of your dog is that it's concentrated into one spot typically. So it's too much urea. So it's an over fertilization. So that's actually burning the lawn from too much nitrogen fertilizer coming out of your dog's ear. So that's why ah. dog pee spots kill. Now you'll also notice in some cases, dog pee spots turn the lawn dark green. So then you have a bunch of dark green splotches everywhere. That's just because whatever dog you have didn't have either a high enough concentration or not enough volume of urine to cause the burn. So instead it turned the area dark green. And then third case you'll see is the middle of a spot is brown, right directly outside of the spot is dark green and the rest of the lawn is pale green. These are all things that dog pee can do to the lawn. So what do you do to get rid of it? Dogs and trees, natural enemies to lawns. Not really a lot you can do. So I tell folks when they have that is give the dog the backyard, do the best you can and make your front yard pristine and don't let the dog pee out there. Good compromise. I have 11 stage water filtration system under my sink and it also has a RO and, but it has re-alkalizing mineral car, two of them, two different types. So there's so many minerals and I put uh, colloidal mineral drops in our dog's water and like our coffee and everything. So it's super mineralized and there's so much mineral, the dog fuck twitching <laughs> <laughs> just like, and he's pissing all over the lawn, dude. Anyways, I was just thinking. Is it potent? About, Does your dog have some potent urea? No, they're totally well. He does, right outside of our patio. He's always pissing in the same spot, and it is it does affect the lawn. It's uh where he pisses in the same spot, it turns brown and dies. And 
dogs. Yep, yep. There's a theory that female dogs are worse because they squat, whereas male dogs will usually t- pee on a post or they'll kill bushes. Anybody that's ever had a large dog that pees on the bush, they'll kill your bushes. So they're saying that I curb. I'm not a dog owner, but they'll say that female dogs are lower to the ground, so they actually cause more damage because of that. You don't know if that's true or not. That reminds me. You gave me a funny memory. Now I got to tell it. I showed up early one morning to a customer's property to trim all their shrubs in the backyard. And they had this like huge golden Labrador and they let the dog out to go potty in the backyard. And this dog peed like a 90 second horse piss. And I'm like looking at my, anyways, it was the longest pee ever. It didn't even seem possible. Okay. Been locked in all night. <laughs> my dogs would just piss on the carpet. That's why I had to rip it up in our basement. Anyways. That's a blessing. Pissing me off, man. Is that why you don't have dogs? All right. Could be. It's mainly for the lawn now. Someone say concrete. There we go. Back Your Yard says, Keith, what's the most professional way, in your opinion, to deny a client service due to your personal capacity capabilities? <laughs> you know what I do? I tell a white lie to the customers. I say, oh, I'm so sorry. We're booked literally until September. If it's like all the way in like April or May, I'll push something out like four or five months or even say we're already booked for the entire year of 2023. Things like that. Because when we get really booked out and we still have anywhere from 15 to 30 phone calls coming in per day, I get very, very, very picky and qualifying and over qualifying customers and who is allowed to even get a quote and even get on the list. It has to be like, we call it cherry picking jobs, but I also don't want to tell the customers straight up no on the phone because I'm running a service business. So according to the qualifications I have before, it sounds like it's not a good fit (laughs) and just get off the phone. And while you can say that to some customers, other customers might get offended. So I feel sometimes forced to be like, oh, sorry, we're booked out for four months. We're booked to maximum capacity. We can't take on any more work. So you could just be honest or figure out any other way. But that's how I deny customers if I have to. Green Up Lawn Care says, learned a valuable lesson today. Also on having a smile when giving quotes. First thought. She was window shopping, but ended up accepting my $3,500 bid without shopping around. We'll take a day to do. Very nice, sir. Yeah, we just did a $2,175 job this morning, ripping out some bushes and trimming a couple ornamental trees and grinding some stumps. And we were in and out in an hour and 45 minutes with a... Wow. Our four or five... How many people? One, two, three, four, five-man crew. We were in and out like boom, boom. What do you recommend, Drew's Lawn Care says, for killing POA in St. Augustine? What's that? POA, he's talking about probably POA annua or Hoanna, as they say in Georgia. Pretty sure atrazine. I'm not looking at a label right now, Drew, but I think atrazine is going to be your best choice. Look for heat restrictions, though. So you might have to spray in the morning, but pretty sure atrazine will work well for you. Cheap, too. Love it. Carmen Knoll. Try to get to the rest of these comments. I chucked my Scott's spreader yesterday and ordered a new Lesco spreader. That's a nice upgrade. Really nice. Jeez, you're going to love that. It's going to change your life. I've broken several Scott spreaders, and I've broken a Lesco spreader, too, because we're Dragon Melt Ice Melt for snow. The heavy-duty Lesco spreaders that cost like a 1000 bucks. we just fill it up with salt. Well, not salt, but ice melt, because salt will get jammed in there if it's too big of the rock. Just hammer it. Yeah. Back your yard. Very well put. Thank you for sharing. You the man. Okay, what's else here? Anyways, any more comments? That's good. Oh, we're, we're right on the money, 4.59 p.m. So the Lawn Care Nut on Instagram, where can people find you? Yeah, Alan Hain, A-L-L-Y-N-H-A-N-E. Or just search Lawn Care Nut Instagram, it knows. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And guys, go check out his videos on YouTube. They're amazing. They're entertaining. Your camera presence is, I don't know, bar none. It's amazing. Thanks, bro. Thank you, Keith. This is a lot of fun, man. Seriously. Thanks for having me on. I love rapping with you. You always get me fired up. So this is fun doing it live like this too, bro. I really appreciate it. Like I said, you just, you give me a chance to kind of let loose a little bit. And I love that. So thank you. Mm-hmm. And next time uh, we come to Florida, food. I want to buy you lunch. And those grouper sandwiches were amazing at that place. When we yeah, went over to that place again, bro. We'll go out to the River Rue over by there. Have a couple, two, three uh, sandwiches. Have a good time over there. Love it. All right. Oh, yeah. The the Untrapped Podcast, if you're listening to this there on Apple or Spotify, please give this show a well-worded review and it boosts up the ratings so more people can listen to it. Do you have a podcast, Alan? Yeah, I do. It's called Lawns Across America. I do uh, lawn tips there and I do some interviews and stuff like that. Is this on Apple Podcast? Yeah, it's on Apple. Yeah, Apple. It's on YouTube. It's on Spotify. All that stuff. 
lawns across America. All right. Thanks so much. And thanks, everybody, for joining in. Thanks for being on the show. And we'll see you guys next time. Oh, yeah. I got to tell you on who's on tomorrow. We've been going live at 4 p.m. Eastern every day. This is a cool format. You introduced me to this. I didn't even know this was an option on YouTube. (laughs) Tell you just looking at right now all right friday we have shots daily hustle john's a good dude like him he's awesome all right i'll see you guys tomorrow 4 p.m later